So he hello everyone. Uh, my name is Ryan Talavis and uh, my presentation is uh, titled The Beaver Project. So this is a 101 on uh, digital advertising and ad technology and ad fraud. So uh, I work for Zvilo. So we're a web categorization company. So we work with digital advertising. I work for FireEye as well. Then I did some work on honeypots and security analytics. So this will all like, like fold together after I go through this thing. So in any case, let's talk about our main topics. So we'll talk about first the business and currency of digital advertising. It's like, why am I even talking about this? Why is this even relevant? Then uh, we're going to go through like ad tech, the ecosystem. I can't go through like that much details with the ecosystem, but I will give you the basics, like uh, how to start off with the foundations and stuff, because this is a very, very complex ecosystem. Then after that, we'll go through like ad fraud, we'll talk about the taxonomy, the different types of ad fraud, is, such as like publisher-based ad fraud, malicious and objectionable content, and of course, non-human traffic, and my pet project there, the Bieber project. So first, why are we even talking about this? So the business of digital advertising. Basically, we are talking about this because digital advertising is big money. So the total, total digital ad spend is estimated about $60 billion this 2015. And it is estimated also that five years from now, the digital ad spend would be ab about $100 million. So it is a big pie. And a lot of uh, different people would like a big chunk of those pie. So that's why this is a very, very important topic right now, like in, in ad tech and even in security. So let's talk about the currency of uh, digital advertising. So digital advertising has several metrics, but one of the most important and primary metric is the number of delivered or served impressions. When I say impressions, that's views. So, but the primary problem here is not all online ads are actually seen, as you probably uh, understand. Like, advertisers are obviously not interested, really. They're, they're not interested in paying for ads that were never seen, obviously, right? So, so here's the thing. Let's go through, like, the different metrics here. So, so when you start viewing an ad, you'll, pro you'll see first, right, there's an ad there on the left-hand side of the viewable impression. You see the ad, and that's the viewable impression. Next, you have the clicks, which is the other one. Then you have the conversion, and the conversion could be a purchase, it could be a sign-up form, and stuff like that. But what we're going to really talk about and focus in this talk is really the viewable impressions, because that is really the primary metric that we're talking about. And if like the primary metric, if the impression is fraudulent, in most cases, all the, the whole chain would be fraudulent. So that is basically the currency of digital advertising. What I'm going to go through next is like the ecosystem. So when I first, uh, when I first uh, moved to digital advertising, I came from security. And when I first came from, like, to digital advertising, someone showed me this. This is the Lumascape of digital advertising. And when I saw that, like, oh man, I don't know what to do with this. So it's very complicated. And well, we won't go through this today. So what we're going to go through is like a, a distilled version. So I actually made this, but I even distilled it more. We're going to talk about the main entities in digital advertising, which is the advertiser, the demand side platform, the ad exchange, the supply side platform, and the publisher. So this is my real 101 version here. So here's my 101 version. So first to think about is like the two ends of the spectrum. So the two ends of the spectrum is the advertiser, which are the ones who sell the product, and the publisher, who is selling the ad space, the media space. They're your, like, uh, it's your blog. It's like CNN, it's ESPN. And obviously the advertisers are the main product guys, like Nike, Ford, and all of those kinds of guys. So the advertisers would have, typically the big advertisers would have like advertising agencies, like you know, Mad Men stuff. So like here, you have an advertising agency. One of the bigger ones is WPP. And then what happens here, they produce a concept. 
But in terms of digital advertising, the real important one is the demand side platform, the DSPs. So this is where really the magic happens. This is where the campaigns are made. This is, uh, this, it's very important because this is where you actually enter like targeting information, like who do I want this ad to be served? Like what demographics, what location, and all of that stuff. So in the other end of the spectrum, you have the SSP, the supply side platform. So what the supply side platform is, is it manages the impressions that comes from the different publishers. And it all intersects in this ad exchanges. Think of the ad exchange as a marketplace, an auction place of these different impressions. And what happens is the DSP matches its criteria to all the impressions that are being sold. Let me give you like an example. Like for example, like Ford. Ford wants to do like an ad like an ad campaign for like, say the F-150. So, so they wanted to do like a year-end F-150 campaign. So the advertising agency conceptualizes it. Then it goes to the DSP. So what happens there? Like, okay, what, what we want, we want these ads to be shown at these particular times at, well, all devices, then uh, for only the United States. Let's say that's their criteria, that's their targeting criteria. So for example, like my blog received the impression or a view from let's say the Philippines, like Manila. So it goes there, it goes, it goes to the auction house and it sees like, hey, this impression is coming from Manila. Does it fit the criteria, like the bidding criteria? No, like there's no F-150s in, in Manila. So what happens there is it gets rejected. And for example, something comes in like, hey, this impression comes from Colorado from a mobile site. So it actually fits the criteria. So that's when the DSP starts the, the bid. And if it wins the bid, the ad is served. So that is really the general gist of what's happening in an ad exchange. So I know this is pretty high level, and we can go, go there, to like, uh, we can go like into more detail like after this. I'll just be walking around here if you guys want to like talk to me about the ad ecosystem. But this is enough to start talking about ad fraud and all that kind of stuff. So one thing you might want to go deeper is like, how do you actually like serve an ad? So here is a process of serving an ad. There's actually three things. First, make the campaign. So that's where the DSP part happens, right? This, the DSP would usually have, usually have like a campaign management system. And this campaign management system will have like the ability to like add uh, targeting information, which I will show you a little bit, like some screenshots, like bigger screenshots. So I think it's hard to see there. So with the bidding process also, this, the bidding process is what I told you guys about, about the, diff, the ad exchange where the, all the impressions are happening and where the DSPs and the SSP link together. Then if the bid wins, then the ad is served. So let me give you like some quick screenshots of like what a campaign management system looks like. So you see here, you can actually define what your budget is then you can like uh, set like different demographics, like what location you want this particular ad to show up. Then you can also like do a lot of st things. You can actually pick what particular operating systems it should show up in, like what particular devices it should show up in, like all different platforms you can actually pick. So it's very good at these targeting. So just think about that. And then you can also do like all sorts of stuff, like contextual stuff. You can do keywords, topics, sentiment. So it's very, very like, uh, very smart, very smart in terms of targeting. So next, you can actually pick also what inventory, like what publishers to publish on. So it's very, very good at that. Then here's the thing, you can actually like, you can start uploading your creatives here. So you can actually like uh, uh, upload your GIFs, your JPEGs, and your flash files. So you're probably thinking, right? Like malvertising, redirects, targeting. So these you can do like uh, you can do all start uh, stuff with this one. Like you can do like like targeted attacks if you wanted to. 
but uh, that's why like malvertising is so big now. But we're not going to talk. Uh, we're going to talk about like malvertising in a little bit. So I think that is enough for the, the background. We can talk now about like the ad fraud problem itself. So what is ad fraud? So it is the deliberate practice of attempting to serve ads that have no potential to be viewed by a human user. So basically, like you're serving ads, and no one, and you're purposely serving ads that no one is seeing. So that is basically the definition of ad fraud. Though, though in the taxonomy, it's kind of weird, but you'll see that later. So the the problem, there's a lot of claims about how big and the big uh, the extent of the problem is so in some cases in the low end they says that they say that ad fraud and uh, like uh, fraudish impressions are about 13 percent at the low end and 60 percent at the high end so what's the significance of this if you think about let's let's use the low end like the 13 percent so if you think about it the total digital ad spend is 60 billion so even with 30%, that's about 7 billion, I think. So th that is a pretty big chunk of the pie, right? So who's, who's uh, losing money? Obviously the advertisers. So a lot of people are saying, yeah, they, they have too much money anyway. But hey, that's a big chunk of, big chunk of change. So in any case, who are the actors? Who are actually like making money? out of this. So obviously, the ones who sell traffic. So they make money out of like generating traffic. And the next one, obviously, who makes money uh, in adver advertising? It's the publishers. It's like the blogs, the big websites, and all of that stuff. So how do they make money? So if they purchase traffic, there's a cost there. And they get money from the advertisers, so they make money off of the spread. So uh, in maybe two weeks from now, I'm releasing another paper called The Economics of Ad Fraud. So I guess just wait for it and stuff. So uh, what are we doing about it? So before I go through that, I want to introduce you to the Interactive Advertising Bureau. So when I first started, like uh, when I moved to my new job in, in like, like the ad digital advertising, I, the first meeting I went to was the anti-malware group of the, the IAB. So the IAB actually develops industry standards for online digital advertising. So they, they are actually doing really good things, but honestly, it's a bit confusing. Like I was confused at first, especially with the ad fraud taxonomy. They have this whole list about like ad fraud. Like, here is just like a quick outline, and it had me baffled because some of it like crisscrossing and like, why is this actually ad fraud? So what I'm going to do now is actually distill this taxonomy into something a little bit simpler and a little bit more straightforward. So there are basically three main types of ad fraud. The first one is publisher tricks to increase, increase impression count. We'll talk about that later. Second one, is serving illegal or malicious content. The third one is using non-human traffic to increase impressions. So you see here, right, two, the one and three, two of them are actually directly related to increasing impressions. So directly related for like generating money. But the second one is actually a little bit different. It's serving content. It's about serving the wrong kind of content. So let's go for, for the first one first. So the idea of publisher tricks to increase impression count is to make like, uh, not really one ad impression, but make a few ad impression looks like, uh, look like more ad impressions. So how does that happen? So some of the prominent examples here are the hidden pixels. Yeah, one by one is an old one, but it's usually, they term it like hidden pixels or ad stacking. That, those are prominent examples. So how does that happen? Like for example, like uh, I view one website and I see one ad, like that red block there, assume that's an ad. So you see one ad, but the publisher reports that I saw three. So that's how the publisher tricks work. Let me give you like some examples like with the hidden pixels and the ad stacking. So, so typically you want to see this. 
So if you see this, you see three ads, right? So that is legit. That's correct. But for example, you see this, like hidden ads. So when you look at the page, like let's say you look at that page, you see no ads. But it is actually serving 10 or more. Well, and why? Because they're embedding the ads or the web page containing the ads in like these tiny iframes that you cannot see. So you're actually generating like a ton of impressions without anyone seeing the ads. So that's the general idea of these hidden ads. Then it's the same thing with ad stacking. You pretty much just stack the ads. So you, I guess you see this a lot in porn sites or something. So, so with the, like uh, for example, you see one ad, then you don't know that there's other ads there. So you see one ad, but it's actually generating or serving like let's say more, like 10 or more or something like that. So the thing here is like, you know, this is, uh, this is, this is kind of effective, but you know, uh, it's rarely seen now, uh, less than before. Because you know why? Because it's risky to the publisher. Because the, the, the uh, publishers make money out of their site. And the publishers are doing this on their site. So it can be directly attributed to them. So they don't want that happening. So that's why this is a little less prevalent nowadays, these like publisher tricks to do this. And so let's go to the, uh, let's go to the next one. So, oh, oops, oops, oops. Okay, so serving objectionable and malicious content. So sometimes ad fraud doesn't directly mean increasing impressions. So though it could lead to that, so in this case, like the prominent examples are like serving malware. So like malvertising, sometimes adware, but that's a gray area. Then scams like fraud, fraud fraudulent websites and stuff like that. Then non-brand safe or objectionable. When I say objectionable, non-brand safe, these are serving ads that pertain to like violence, child pornography, uh, hate and stuff like that. So there's also like cool categories regarding like objectionable categories that you'll see. So how does this work? Well, well, we're, we just go back to our, uh, like how ads are served. So for example, you were like a malicious advertiser. You, you wanted to like uh, send uh, like, uh, like IRS scam or something through an ad. Then you just make the, you just make the correct campaign like, uh, campaign setup in the DSP, and if you win the bid, you pretty much just like uh, like uh, get all your ads through the publisher, which ends up in the user. So it's fairly straightforward, and that's also what happens like when you talk about like malvertising as well. So so that is the malicious content stuff. So I'll give you some examples. So when I started like. Uh, doing research on this, I was looking at an ad network. I was looking at the inventory of an ad network. And well, needless to say, in some ad networks, the inventory, like the, the publisher inventory are, is like very dirty. So you see here, like they were serving malware. There's tons of adware. There, here's the thing when I say like uh, some cases, like even if you serve like malicious, like, uh, like uh, illegal content, it could actually generate more, like more impressions, such as adware. Then, like here's an interesting thing, like scams and stuff, and the power of, of like targeted advertising. You, oh, it's too small. Like for example, in that very left hand side, the, the, the square in the lower left, I actually like loaded that in our Manila office. So the interesting thing is like I got like a fraudulent like scamish website that's directed to the locale. So you see there it's in pesos and the, uh, all, all the department stores there are actually like in the local area. So it's really smart doing it this way, like uh, sending your malicious stuff through ads because you can actually target specific demographics. So that's what's really cool about that stuff. So now, we can start talking about uh, non-human traffic. So most of the time, when you talk about non-human traffic, you think about bots, and it really, yeah, it is bots. But in some cases, it gets lumped in, like some other stuff gets lumped in, some gray areas. 
and it's not actually bots, but actually like human impressions that are kind of low quality. So I'll show that to you guys in a little bit. So let's talk about non-human traffic. So what is the best way to investigate this? So in my, when, when I started this, the best way to investigate this was actually start buying traffic as well. So that's what I did. So the two main questions that I wanted to uh, answer is what is purchased internet traffic made of and can I buy internet traffic and get away with it? So that's, the, and that's the start of, well, the Bieber project. So the Bieber project is just, really, it's all like just a ton of Bieber blogs that I made that are basically honeypots. So that's, that's really it. So, and I did not make the content by myself. So I just grabbed it from different sites, but I had a ton of them. So anyway, so the idea here is to like, uh, buy purchase traffic and purposely direct those fraudulent impressions in those blogs and in those uh, blogs actually have like like a means to record the impressions and what particular types of characteristics and attributes that I wanted to get and then I collected the information and did the analysis so so I said collected, right? So I used a lot of JavaScript and I used a lot of like server-side script and combined it. And you can get a lot out of a browser using JavaScript, right? There's a ton of stuff that you can get. And that's really what I used to figure out like what is this traffic actually is. And I just stored the data for analysis and just went through it. Then next is the fun stuff. I started buying traffic. So initially I was thinking like, oh, this might be hard. Like where do I buy traffic? Because like, unlike, like, uh, like for example, it's like hard to get like, uh, typically it's, I, I thought it was going to be as difficult as getting like malware, but no, it's actually really easy. So there were a ton of vendors that I found like selling traffic. And these are just one of the few I, probably like I used 30 for this experiment. And there's also like traffic marketplaces out there where you can buy all sorts of stuff. So not only internet traffic, not only impressions, but you can buy like uh, YouTube views, YouTube likes, YouTube uh, subscribers, Twitter followers. And actually like I spoke in the DEF CON kids this morning that uh, other one, the Roots Asylum, it was a little, uh, what I presented was a little bit different. The, it, it wasn't ad tech. So, so I did like an experiment. So I had, I had a Twitter account. So I opened that like maybe a long time ago when I started like, because I gave a talk here in DEF CON and I think it be before, and I think I needed a Twitter account. So I had a Twitter account like op open for four years and I had 21 followers for four years. And a few days ago, I started buying followers. And, and now I have 4,000 followers. Impressive, huh? So <laughs> anyway, anyway, so, so uh, enough about that. So that's off topic. So traffic marketplaces. And now let's talk about like, what is purchased internet traffic made of? So well, bots, really, like most of it. So how do you know, as I mentioned, like the clues are actually in the impression itself. Like uh, you gr grab it using JavaScript or some server side code and you just analyze it. So there are a lot of clues. And you know, right, like browsers can leak a ton of information about you, about what you're doing. And, the, and all you need is like some quick JavaScript. Honestly, I'm not a JavaScript guru or anything like that. I was just using like, like, a, like W3C stuff. So anyway, so, uh, so you can look for suspicious information. For, for example, like plugins. Does it have plugins? Like a lot of bots doesn't have plugins. Does, does the plugin uh, match what the browser is and all of that stuff? Mime types, screen attributes. Does it even have screen attributes? And window attributes, how big is the viewport? Is it giving you like the correct viewports? Uh, product identifiers, are all the product identifiers matching? So does it look like that it's actually saying that browser is actually what it's saying it is? Navigator, location attributes, frame rates. 
Does it even have like a frame rate, like a frame rate, the animation frame rates, right? Like is, and is it even rendering JavaScript? So there's, there's a ton of stuff that you can look at and determine whether it's a, like non-human traffic. And of course, user agents. But as you all know, like user agents are very easy to, to forge and stuff like that. But you know, oh, th these are just the, like the clues, like sometimes like, a, like a, all the stuff that I've collected. But sometimes the like, clues are really obvious. You know, when I, when I started buying like uh, internet traffic, the cheapest one I noticed didn't even care to mask the traffic, that it was like bots. So it was like plain sight in their user agents. So, so the cheaper you get, the more bots and cheaper bots you get. So not all tra traffic are made equal. So uh, I say like, uh, this is actually like inaccurate. It should be like weaker approaches and like smarter approaches. So what are the weaker approaches? Well, you use traffic generators. So there's a ton of traffic generators out there that you can buy. You can purchase traffic, right? But why not generate the traffic yourselves? So you can use like traffic generators. So there's a lot out there and I won't really like go through each one of them. And the thing is, like, I made like a, a summary of all of this. Yeah, so, so I'll stop here. Like the custom stuff. So you can actually like do custom stuff. And you, it's too small there, but you see the, uh, like a lot of these custom stuff are actually made by like uh, through like Ubot Studio. I'm not sure if anyone's familiar with Ubot Studio, but it's an awesome software. It's, it's, it's not malicious, it's actually a legit software. And uh, what you use it for is for webmasters to help facilitate like automating stuff in their websites, like logging in, doing stuff, posting stuff. But you know, all good things can have like a bad aspect as well. And you can also use this to like create followers, click on likes create subscribers and all of those stuff. So you can like pretty much manipulate that. And, but really it's like, like, uh, it's like the auto it of internet bots. So it's, it's, it's really like very, very useful. And it has like a scripting language and all of that stuff. So, so you'll see a lot of the, uh, the bots that they're being sold is actually made out of like Ubot Studio. So, Traffic generator statistics. So what are the important things to look for if you are buying a traffic generator? So obviously it has to be able to like click, click on links and click on selected areas. Then delays are very important because you can't have just it bombarding like, uh, like uh, the website, right? Then obviously uh, changing user agents is very important as well. Custom referrers are important. If you're not like CNN or something that where you can just type it in directly in your browser, like for example, you're like a, you're like a blog, like an unknown blog, and you have like, suddenly you have like millions and millions of impressions and you don't have a referrer, that is kind of suspicious, right? So usually you'd want to have like a referrer from a search engine and stuff like that. So you, like someone found your site and went to your site. So that's some of the important things with traffic generators. Obviously proxy support is also very important because like, like uh, you can't have your traffic coming from one IP. But here's the problem also with the IP proxies, uh, with the proxy stuff. Like uh, a lot of the, one of the main things that like for uh, the Interactive Advertising Bureau, IAB is, is like purporting is like uh, having, checking like proxies. And a lot of the proxies you can like scrape from a lot of like different sites. So, so it's a race whether the good guys know the proxy address and versus you. So that's the challenge there. So, but sometimes it is a little bit trickier. So you can do like a more trickier things. So let me tell you about Jingling. So, so Jingling is actually a traffic exchange software and uh, it's, it's in Chinese, but there are like uh, uh, tutorials out there to learn like know what the, the buttons mean. So, so I'll tell you more about Jingling, which is pretty cool. So Traffic Exchange 101. So here, for example, I installed Jingling in my computer. So, but the thing is, like Jingling, it won't visit my website. Because if it, visit my web, if it visits my website, it's just pretty much a traffic generator, right? Jingling actually like visits other people's websites. And when you start visiting other people's websites, 
you generate tokens. And the more tokens you have, the more, uh, like the, the more other people's computers that have Jingling installs, installed visits your website. So that is the general idea of like how Jingling works. So as you see, there's like traffic exchange. And you don't have to think about proxies because it's actually coming from different computers already. So that's the neat thing about Jingling. So let me show you some, some like a quick video of the Jingling stuff. So what I'll do is like, I won't run the whole video. Because, I mean like I'll just do like manual fast forward stuff. So here is Jingling on, oh, it's not showing up. Uh, how does this work? It's not showing up. Maybe, maybe. Oh, there it is. There it is. Oh my. This is. Oh. 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 Maximize. Oh, this is going to suck. <laughs> oh my. Oh no. I'll drag it over. I'm, yep, there, right? So, so I'm releasing. I'm releasing the thing. Oh, oh, it works. Oh, that embarrassed me. So where's that, that thing? That, how do I uh, actually, like, uh, I can't find the... Oh, my God. Oh. Thank you. Unfortunately, this is going to be really difficult for me. Okay, so let me go through this and yeah, it's going to be a little bit difficult. So, yep. So you see there on the right, that's Jingling and I have like Wireshark open. So let's go through this. So yes, so it's running. So started Jingling, added my site. So you see like Wireshark is already running and I'm visiting like sites already. So this is my Bieber blog and you just see like these are my logs. So these are my website logs. So let's go, let's continue, let's continue. And you see here, I'm already receiving like impressions right off the bat. Let's go. So Jingling has started like a spawning, a spawning process and it is very resource intensive. It actually like eats a lot of resources, as you'll see here. It's already connecting like to different IP addresses and you see here like it's pretty much spiking my memory and I have it at low priority actually. So lots of resource utilization. So let's see what's happening in the network. So it's already visiting a lot of sites. I'll have like some stats for you at the end of this. So there you go. So traffic on my computer is very busy. As like you see there in the, on the left-hand side with Wireshark, it's really like, a, like, a, like banging away. So here's my logs, it's continually uh, going stuff. And here's the interesting stuff. One of the main things that they told me with Jingling, one of the weaknesses, is most of the traffic actually comes from China. But, you know, like in my most recent ones, no, it's actually coming from all over the world. And uh, I don't have like actual stats, but in my sampling, yeah, most of it is, it's not really like all China and it's not majority even. So I'm getting like a lot of stuff here, that stuff. So it's still working. Oops, I can't find it. There you go. So let's, so. So at this point, like there's like already like a ton of jingling processes there. Uh -huh. It's very busy, yep. So let us generate some stats now. Whoop. 
So I'm generating the stats off Wireshark. So here's the interesting thing here. So, so what happened here, like, like for, I ran it for 30 minutes, just 30 minutes. So for 30 minutes, I generated 4,000 re HTTP requests from my computer alone. So, so it's a lot. And like, I've probably visited about 300 to 400 unique websites. So it is a lot of stuff. You might be wondering, how much impressions did I get? For that 30 minutes, I only got about 200. So it's not fair, huh? So, so I am actually like generating way more than I am getting. But still, still, like if you look at the impressions, they look like pretty quality impressions. And it's all over the world. So it's uh, kind of useful. So next, let's move on. Okay, we're, we're done with the jingling stuff. Oh, let's Oh, oh, oops, oops. There, then, of course, there is malware as well. So this is like the, one of the last NHT stuff that I'm going to like show you guys. So the problem here is I have another video. So next, let me open the stuff for my adware video. Okay, let's move it here. Oh, it's not working. There you go. View, enter full screen. There you go. Here we go. So same with the jingling stuff. I'm going to just forward it manually. So I will tell you about like the characteristics of a malware that does ad fraud. So let's go through here. So one of the first things you'll notice is you'll sel seldom notice anything. Just as with all types of like malware, it's very like subtle. So let's go through it. But sometimes you do s notice some funky stuff. Suddenly like, like for example there, uh, like just a pop-up from a web page came out. So where is it coming from? You probably like uh, have an idea already. So the pop-ups are actually coming from hidden windows, like hidden browsers running in the background. So the malware is actually using your browser with your plugins, with your MIME types, exactly like your, uh, and, and working like, and running it off like uh, in the background, but just hidden. So that is very smart, actually. So these are the, like, you s probably see there the hidden windows already. The next. Here's the funny thing though, like, uh, like sometimes, oh, I have 10 minutes. So the funny thing here is, like in some cases, like uh, what you see is, uh, you see clues. Like suddenly, like if the malware author like uh, makes, uh, uh, forgets to like mute the volume, suddenly you're working and suddenly like an ad would play and like you'll see the, you'll hear the audio. And, but there's no like ad anywhere and there's no video anywhere. So that's when you'll see there. So let me make this a little bit faster since I have a 10 minutes already. So he here, as I mentioned, like it hijacks the browser. It's very smart if you hijack the browser because you're using, you're piggybacking off the user actually, the, the user's browser. So it's very hard to like actually like fingerprint it as malicious because you're actually like piggybacking off the user's browser. So that's why it's like really smart. And aside from that, What's really smart about some of the user's browsers, it actually generates scrolling behavior and mouse behavior. You see the scrolling there, right? But the, the mouse behavior is not too uh, obvious. But that's the other thing, because in some cases, you try to detect non-human traffic by checking user events and user engagement. So they try to bypass this use by adding like some user movements. So let me... And that, then, so you can do like trends analysis to catch those. You can do machine learning and like pattern matching. And as I said, you can do like user events and engagements. Humans in general are, have my more purposeful, um, purposeful pattern. Like they go from element to element. They have smoother movements. 
mixtures of events and pauses. So I actually had like another video, but I won't be showing that, but I have like something here, like the actual, like my Bieber websites actually track the user engagements. So it's able to actually like, uh, like track like uh, what element you hovered in, how long you hovered in the element, uh, what is your, what if, even if you highlighted the text, like what text are you highlighting, how long you're staying there, what clicks you are doing. So it actually like gets way more because like some of the like malware, they, they're very like jerky. Like they, they just like do a programmed scroll, then a programmed uh, mouse movement. So there should be like ways to look at other stuff. So as I mentioned, there are gray areas here, not all in NHT. Uh, not all like traffic are made of bots. So here's the, the gray area. So in some cases, when you buy traffic, like the traffic vendors will actually put your website in other high traffic websites and serve it through frames, pop-unders, and pop-ups. And, and a lot of like verification services miss that. They all, all, uh, almost, a lot of them will say like, oh, it's all bots, but sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's human but low quality. So in this case, like for example, in one of the, the things that, uh, one of the vendors I looked at, 70% of all the traffic came from like one pixel. Then other things is like uh, the windows are not active windows. Usually this is indicative of like pop-unders. So pop-unders are actually a gray area because it pop-unders, it pop under, but it's, it's difficult to say whether it was seen or not because uh, it takes like human interaction to actually see a pop under. So can I actually buy internet traffic and get away with it? So first, well, if an advertiser would know what to look for, like the attributes I was telling you guys about, yes, you will get caught. But if not, you will not get caught. And another thing that uh, I discovered when uh, like paying for like all this internet traffic is you get what you pay for. So lower prices, you really get bots. With the higher prices, when you start buying traffic, you'll get frames, pop-ups, and pop-unders. How much time do I still have? So I don't have any more time. Oh, five minutes? So I will just do like a quick wrap up. So we talked about like the business of advertising, right? So, so the important thing to know there is like, yes, it is a very important field to start going into. Like, as I mentioned, it is a $60 billion uh, industry right now and just, it just keeps on growing. And there is like a lot of stuff that you can like, uh, like uh, uh, figure out there. The next is the ecosystem. Remember, important things, publishers, advertisers, you had the demand side platforms where you do the campaigns and supply side platforms which manages the impressions. And you have the ad exchanges which are, which are basically the, the marketplaces for these impressions. And finally, you have the publisher fraud, you have the uh, uh, malicious content serving and the non-human traffic. So that is it for me. So if you like my presentation, please visit us at zvelo.com. So I would like to mention my books. It's totally unrelated to ad fraud or ad tech, but please check it out anyway. So with that, like I'll just be here. If you have like any questions, I'll be walking around. Thank you very much. It was great being here.